Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Buddy Baruku. I'm with CGAP, um, and I uh, would like to welcome you to our, the first of our two-part webinar series on unlocking women's financial inclusion in Africa. Um, we have a lot to cover, uh, so I feel like we should get started right away. Thank you for joining us again, and uh, hopefully those who uh, join a little bit later can still catch up to the content. Uh, you should see in, on, on this presentation, on, on, in this webinar that we have a presentation, and so I will be going through that uh, with you. But first, some housekeeping issues. This is an audio broadcast. Uh, your microphones will be muted throughout the webinar, but we do look forward to getting um, your comments in the chat box at any time during the webinar, uh, and we'll keep track of your questions and, and pose those uh, to our speakers um, to answer during the Q&A session. Be sure to um, uh, direct your comments and questions to everyone so that those can be seen by all. And uh, finally, you will receive a link uh, to this presentation as well as to the video recording after the, the event is over in due course uh, so that you can have that for your own records. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, CGAP, the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, is a global partnership of about 30 uh, development organizations which are housed or come together under an, one institution, CGAP, housed within the World Bank Group. Our particular focus is on financial inclusion and how digital financial services can be used to further that objective. We do that by doing everything from working with industry on piloting proof of concept uh, to working with regulators um, on, on enabling environments for, for, for DFS, and then also just by uh, promoting the growth of, of DFS through um, in, in introducing new business models. Our work in Ghana uh, which is where um, we are, um, is uh, funded by SECO, which is the Swiss Development Agency. This is part of a five-year uh, project focused on four particular areas, which is supporting Ghana's cash life vision, um, enhancing uh, supervisory and regulatory capacity, um, creating, a, 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 I guess, an environment where um, regulators, industry, and other players can, can convene to discuss uh, critical issues, and then supporting growth of the DFS space through training and, and, and exposure to other DF, uh, business models, as mentioned. Um, but, of course, I, I do want to say before I move on, you know, the work is entirely funded by SECO, as is the work that is going to be presented today, so we want to give a special shout-out to SECO for their support um, in, in, and their role in really driving Ghana's DFS space, which is, as many of you will know, uh, one of the, the, the key examples of the growth of DFS in Africa. So, um, before I move on to the actual presentation, I just wanted to give some context for those of you who are not familiar that, um, you know, mobile money in particular and DFS more broadly has had a huge impact on the growth uh, of the number of people with access to financial inclusion. Based on the World Bank Index study between 2014 and, and 2017, the number of people with access to any financial account um, in Ghana has gone up by 42%. But what is most notable is that 199% growth in the number of people who have access to a mobile money account, um, as opposed to a 22% growth of the people who have access to any financial institution account. So what really that tells you is that DFS, and particularly mobile money, has a huge um, role to play in, in, in reducing that access gap. That being said, there still remains a gender access gap. This slide shows a number of countries across the continent uh, and indicates the number of percentage points gap between the level of access for males and the level of access for females. Ghana is at eight percentage points. Uh, I believe the best performing uh, country on the continent is Mauritius at six percentage points. But there are a number of countries that still have quite a long way to go. That being said, you know, we don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much in Ghana. All of us have a long way to go in order to get that uh, financial access to parity. So without further ado, today our discussion will have the following components. We will, uh, African Sites will present the findings of a 2020 uh, study conducted here in Ghana on women's financial inclusion. 
and then there will be a panel discussion um, of Pan-African perspectives on women's financial inclusion. The panelists are Clarissa Kudowar from the Bank of Ghana, Esther Dasanu of the African Development Bank, and Mercy Munoni of the Zambian Ministry of Finance. Um, so definitely an esteemed panel. This will be followed by um, a discussion within the panelists, among the panelists. And finally, uh, we'll open it up to discuss and respond to the questions we would have received in the chat box. Altogether, we should be together for 90 minutes. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Alicia, who can um, take us through the findings of the study. And let me just, oh, I'm trying to hand over presentation right. Okay, there we go. Alicia, can you please confirm? Let me see, buddy. Um, Sing over presenter privileges to Alicia. All right. Now. Okay. Wonderful. So um, thanks for the intro, buddy. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today in this exciting discussion on women's financial inclusion in Africa. Uh, before deep diving into part one of this webinar, just a very brief intro on our shelf. So I'm Alicia Torne, Director at Africa Insights, which is a Pan-African primary market research and consulting firm aiming to address the knowledge gap challenge that many decision makers are facing across the African continent. Having said that, let's get down to business. Oh, sorry. Um, all right. So um, let's take a glance at what financial inclusion currently looks like around the globe on a continental and, as you can see, to some extent, regional level. Uh, from this slide, I would like you to focus on three main ideas. Number one, the progress made in sub-Saharan Africa. Picking up on some stats that Buddy has provided uh, just a few minutes ago, we can see that mobile money and fintech solutions have been the key drivers to increase in financial inclusion, not only in Ghana, but in sub-Saharan Africa as a whole over the last years. Number two is Ghana's performance. So uh, in terms of financial inclusion, you can see that Ghana is right in between its regional cluster and uh, the world's average. So it's a 35% ahead of sub-Saharan average, but 16% behind the world average. Uh, number three is what's next? So uh, we can also see here uh, that there are other African countries which are performing better than Ghana. Uh, this is the case, for example, of Kenya, which is more of an advanced economy and has a higher penetration of financial inclusion um, due to innovative solutions such as M-Pesa, as you probably know. Um, so this means that there is still room for improvement and growth for Ghana. Um, in this regard, um, as Barry was mentioning before, our panelists will be sharing some lessons and experiences from some other African countries uh, during a discussion that we will be having later today. All right. What do we have here? Um, well, so also as mentioned a few minutes ago, um, as you can see, Ghana has made a headway towards achieving universal financial inclusion in the last few years. Um, albeit slightly dated stats, and hence uh, this research study with SICA. The chart on the left uh, that you can see focuses on financial accounts ownership provides a clear illustration of this progress, especially when looking at the growth figures from 2014 to 2017. So we can see a 42% increase in registered financial accounts, a 22% increase um, in financial institution accounts, and an almost 200% increase in mobile money accounts. So um, it is reasonable to say that mobile money has been one of the main drivers of financial inclusion in Ghana over the last decade. Now, if we move to the chart on the right, uh, we have mobile money account ownership broken down by gender. Uh, uh, and this information here shows us that even though mobile money is greatly increasing access for women, as you see 12% in 2014 versus 34% in 2017, um, as with other financial services, mobile money still has a significant gender gap. So, uh, as you can see, it has increased by four over time. Uh, therefore, there needs uh, to be a concerted effort to address this issue be beyond just expanding access to mobile money. Um, the question here is why 
and what are the continued challenges for women's financial inclusion in Ghana? Moving forward, um, now that we have the problem identified and framed, so uh, this is a, a general financial inclusion gender gap, specifically a 400% increase in mobile money account ownership gender gap. The objective of the study that we conducted with SICA uh, was to A, better understand the financial inclusion gender gap in Ghana, and B, to provide some powerful insights and deliver actionable recommendations to address it. To achieve this purpose, as you can see, the study focused on getting a better sense of the following three areas. Number one, the impact of the assess on gender. Number two, the financial inclusion initiatives with a gender focus that were being pursued by the regulatory and supply side. And finally, number three, any evidence that suggested impact on job creation and entrepreneurship. Uh, in this study, we asked questions around uh, why are some of the reasons this gender gap exists, or how can decision makers build a more gender inclusive digital financial system? In order to make this assessment, what we did is put together a bespoke methodology, which you can see uh, illustrated here in the slide, and we divided it in three distinct phases. In phase number one, which was desk research and analysis, our aim was to understand the impact that certain financial services were already having on segments of women. Also, to draw initial insights of behaviors, pain points, and challenges towards the effects from a gender perspective. And finally, to identify any challenges or uh, potential gaps to inform targeted and focused data collection. And uh, we use this as a basis to design our research instruments for the next phase, which was phase two, primary research and data collection. The goal here was pretty straightforward. Uh, was to understand the financial inclusion landscape with regard to gender. Um, and we did so by undertaking a uh, qualitative research study with selected stakeholders across the demand, supply, and the red side. Um, with regards to the demand side, uh, what we did was undertake a series of in-person focus group discussions with women covering the northern and southern regions of Ghana, um, we looked at target profiles that took into account uh, income, geography, and locations, and we assessed the demand type first so that we could understand uh, users' pain points and needs, and so we were better prepared for the regulatory and supply side interviews, right? So uh, combining the desk research with these demand type findings, we were better informed when conducting supply and regulatory side uh, stakeholder interviews. Now, to assess supply and rec sites, what we did is um, undertake several stakeholder interviews, and this included DSS providers, uh, banks, and MNOs, uh, fintechs, regulatory bodies, um, development institutions. The idea here was to gauge their insights and, and their perceptions on the subject matter. Finally, as you can see, phase number three, uh, the analysis and reporting. In here, we drew uh, some key insights from an holistic perspective that allowed us to answer our research questions, and we covered areas such as uh, unique challenges faced by the demand side, or for example, to what extent supply and regulatory uh, were playing a role to overcome uh, these challenges identified. As you can see in the arrow beneath, uh, throughout the study, we used an analytical framework that was designed by the Alliance for Financial Inclusion, uh, which assesses the four dimensions of financial inclusion, which are um, access, the usage, which both of them are quite self-explanatory, um, quality, which relates to the appropriateness of financial services, and finally, welfare, uh, that uh, really likes to uh, focus on what's the impact that the three other areas have on the livelihoods of women. Now, moving forward into the actual study. Well, what are some of the key findings from this study? Um, from a general perspective, there are two positive overarching takeaways. Number one is the consensus on the positive impact that DSS has on women and, of course, on the general population as a whole. Um, and number two are the high expectations across all stakeholder groups on what DSS can achieve in the years to come. Um, digging a little deeper and from a stakeholder standpoint, 
there are quite a few specific insights, it's, as you can see from the slide. So um, not to overwhelm you, I will just uh, highlight a couple of key takeaways from each group, if that is okay. Um, starting from the demand type, the more pressing ones are the misunderstanding of products and services, in particular when it comes to obtaining credit, um, and also the mistrust in banks, which has further deepened due to the recent banking crisis in Ghana. Um, and this was particularly evident, for example, in the older low to mid income women that participated um, in our focus group discussions. Um, moving to supply side, the most compelling insights are basically the consensus on the enormous unlocked potential of the women market segment from a commercial standpoint. And yet, the awareness and acknowledgement that the supply side players have that in order to reach and understand this and tap the market, there are three key factors which are still needed. These are more data and analytics. Secondly, positive business cases to create solutions. And finally, incentives in the form of grants and or public partner, uh, public private partnerships. Finally, from a regulatory side standpoint, the most critical uh, takeaways are the limited availability of data and insights to support effective gender policy making and uh, the poor, or let's say, not fully important communication and transparency between institutions. Um, Building on these takeaways, let's take now one step further in each stakeholder group, and let's see uh, what are the specific deliverables that we found here. All right, so from a demand side perspective, um, the combined analysis and uh, key takeaways allowed us to paint this illustrative profile that you're seeing here in this slide. Uh, and this relied on variables such as the employment and profession, the education, or the income level. Um, now, profiling allowed us to better understand each cohort. So, understand better who these women are, uh, their basic demographics, their financial activities. And as you can see here, we put together three profiles the entrepreneur, the side hustler, and the restrained borrower. Uh, when we compare the use of financial products, for example, amongst these three profiles, we can see that uh, the entrepreneur type, who is a Momo debt, uh, typically saves through Momo account and doesn't really see the need for a bank account. Um, on the other hand, the restrained borrower, who is also a heavy user of Momo, would likely want to access the bank account, but cannot due to insufficient funds to operate. Contrasting activities and goals, we see, for example, that both the entrepreneur and the side hustler want to diversify income streams and are keen on their children's future. And to this end, for example, the side hustler occasionally makes use of financial products uh, offered by the bank, which are focused on their children's future, for example, junior savings accounts. Finally, looking at their typical pain points and challenges, we see that both side hustler and restrained borrower profiles complain about the bureaucracy and the administration processes of banks. Um, this, for the restrained borrower, means that uh, accessing to bank loans uh, is quite difficult, for instance. And for the side hustler, uh, it is frustrating and time-consuming to utilize a bank account. And for instance, customer service for them was one of their major concerns. Now, why is this important? I mean, what are the benefits of creating this user profile and of ultimately taking a user-centric approach? Well, doing this helps us better understand the gender gap on access and usage and cast a light on solutions that help mitigate the financial inclusion gender gap. From a REC perspective, uh, this, for example, will support interventions that need to be made in order to empower women. And from a supply side point of view, this will be helpful and will support the design and development of products and services that really resonate with women groups. Of course, uh, further research, especially quantitative, is needed in order to obtain more refined and detailed uh, user profiles. Now, let's take one step further in the analysis and see what else uh, we did here in addition to the demand side profile. So, well, once developed uh, this illustrative demand type profile, we combined the key findings from the three stakeholder groups, and we found the big cut across major thematic areas as illustrated in the diagram, right? So, data research, the impact evaluation, relevant appropriateness, literacy and capacity building, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we will be doing in the coming slides is to dissect each of these 
six thematic areas, briefly covering the following three items. Uh, number one, some key specific broken down challenges. Number two, a few current solutions and financial inclusion initiatives with a gender lens that were being pursued by both supply and rec sites at the time that this study was conducted. And number three, where opportunities were found, uh, a few recommendations will be provided in order to help address the financial inclusion gap for women. All right, so first one. Moving to um, data and research. Well, we see that uh, this thematic area here is covering constraints uh, with regards to the limited availability of data and insights, uh, new research studies, disaggregated data collection and analysis, and the understanding of customer behavior, as you can see in the four bubbles on the left-hand side on the slide. Um, in late 2019, when we were conducting this study, uh, some of the initiatives that were being put in place by the REC site were, for example, um, about developing software apps or in-house portals to collect data from the industry with a gender lens. Supply side on their end, um, well, some players interviewed mentioned that their 2020 strategy plans were to focus more on disaggregated data collection, including gender, um, and analysis. Now, um, in addition, what we did is we proposed a couple of recommendations to fill in some of the gaps identified in these thematic areas. Um, and as you can see in this slide, we have listed some of the benefits that stakeholders can derive from the recommendations. Um, you will see that we have followed the same um, logic throughout the remaining slides of, of our presentation. So recommendation number one that you can see here um, is to conduct a national baseline survey on financial inclusion, of course, including a gender lens, um, which is supported by all stakeholders. And this would be very much like how the FinSCO report is produced in countries uh, such as Kenya, Zambia, or, or Uganda. Doing this would allow a better sense of gender particularities and would help to support interventions that need to be made in order to empower women at all levels, let's say uh, individual, familiar, societal. The second recommendation that you can see here is to conduct gender-focused research, taking a more user-centric approach. So uh, more work needs to be done on this front, and research has to be focused on addressing very specific challenges. For example, uh, focusing on women entrepreneurs, like the entrepreneur profile that we saw some slides ago, um, to better understand them and help them enhance uh, their trading, whether that trading is formal or informal. So um, one specific challenge that we could focus on to be uh, obtaining credit. Uh, remember in some previous slides, the key insights and some takeaways from the demand side? Well, we mentioned that obtaining credit uh, was generally misunderstood, right, for the demand side. Uh, it's misunderstood because they take it as a means for emergency cash flow as opposed uh, to helping women's small businesses grow. Now, this misunderstanding is likely because A, credit, and especially the digital one, uh, is not positioned as being for business use, and B, because maybe limits are very low, so it really lends itself better to consumption than to productive use. So learning more about this, for example, could be quite interesting and, and useful. Now let's jump to the second thematic area that we had identified, which is impact and evaluation measurement. And this area here covers uh, issues with regard to tracking and measuring impact and coordinating monitoring activities. So uh, at the time that we conducted this research, there were some emerging appointments, for example, of specific roles within organizations that were to focus full time uh, on certain initiatives, right? So this would mitigate some of the challenges that we're seeing here. Um, there are a couple of recommendations that we believe could be helpful here. Uh, one is to embed an evaluative culture in policies and legislation and to conduct frequent interim evaluations, right? So um, policies and legislations should incorporate a clear implementation roadmap and the KPIs to be monitored and evaluated, the frequency, et cetera, right? So this should be something um, that becomes the general rule. Um, why doing this? Well, as you can see, uh, this would allow stakeholders to manage their interventions and would provide them with uh, timely information to implement any kind of measures uh, if need be. Another recommendation would be to develop, upgrade, and automate monitoring and evaluation system and tools. Um, doing this will allow for a better understanding of reality, situation, would improve management, and maximize the efforts and response actions. 
Additionally, by automating the systems and tools, we will A, reduce the risk of human error, and B, free up resources uh, that then can be allocated in other value-added activities um, or projects. Moving to thematic area number three, uh, relevance and appropriateness. Here, we're talking about uh, mainly concerns and opportunities uh, around the fitness for purpose from a gender lens, of, um, from a gender lens sorry, uh, of the current DFS products and services available in the market, right? And as you can see in the bubbles, uh, key challenges revolve around the lack of a user-centric approach, poor customer service, perceived selection bias. Now, to, to address uh, some of these challenges, there were several players that, when interviewed, mentioned uh, that they were engaged, for example, in financial inclusion uh, for women discussions. How we could advance further on this front of relevance and appropriateness? Well, we are uh, laying down a couple of ideas. First of them is uh, provide more incentives to the private sector and boost public-private partnership and collaboration. So uh, it, is, it is highly advisable uh, to do this in order to develop and launch uh, relevant for purpose products and services. And um, it's also vital for the regulators to create links with other stakeholders, right? So uh, women focus groups, uh, community leaders, et cetera, and to really promote uh, an enabling, inclusive, and a transparent environment. Another recommendation, and we have already spoken about this uh, throughout our presentation is to take a more user-centric approach, right? Um, as already discussed and seen in the illustrative uh, demand type profile, undertaking this type of research with a gender focus is imperative to get a better sense of women and their different profiles, right? So their aspirations, their needs, their problems, um, in order to develop specific solutions that serve them well. Um, in addition to this, supply side training for the staff uh, is also imperative, right? And we will cover this point in the next slide as well. You will see, which, as we were mentioning before, uh, is focused around uh, literacy and, and capacity building. Um, and well, no new thing here, uh, in the sense that, as you very well know, this is a prominent and unfortunately widespread issue. Um, the key challenges that we found, as you can see, are the limited and imbalanced education levels between genders and the poor skills and limited autonomy in some women when operating certain products and services. As per the initiatives that were being pursued by Reg and Supply Side, we found the following, just to name a few. So uh, there were some formative and capacity building programs targeting business women, some of which uh, included coding and programming, for example. And there were also some community dialogues, sensitization, and knowledge sharing programs that were aimed at women. A couple of suggestions that could work to improve this area would be uh, one to reinforce existing financial knowledge and improve upon financial literacy and capabilities. And of course, uh, this is a topic that we have spoken a lot about it, but uh, this is really key. I mean, in terms of economic participation and education opportunities, uh, generally people that have uh, high levels of education tend to have more economic opportunities. So, um, for example, thinking about the entrepreneur profile that we saw before, uh, these women need to be taught financial management skills, in particular the low income and educated, to, for example, avoid misspending money and not uh, splitting their profit from their capital. Um, in this line, one example would be, uh, for example, to provide business owners with training on access to credit and working capital. Another recommendation here is uh, to provide regular training for customers, staff, agents on the products and services. Now, uh, this needs to be an integral part of the service, ensuring that uh, all parties involved really understand the product and that customers especially understand which are the benefits of these products and services and they are confident in using them. And uh, of course, this is also important because it could help uh, improve customer service and reducing some of the existing customer selection bias that we have seen uh, was uh, mentioned to be a, an issue among our demand side women. Now, moving to area number five, uh, limited participation of women. Well, this actually uh, reflects on the current underrepresentation of women at decision making levels and also the limited gender inclusiveness that exists in certain spheres. 
uh, we can say that some of the existing or planned financial inclusion initiatives with the gender focus that uh, we discussed with uh, our interviews. Um, on the regulatory side, for instance, there was some burgeoning policy and legislation that contained some elements to tackle gender inequalities, for example, the Affirmative Action Bill. And on the supply side, uh, some of the players interviewed mentioned that they were planning or had already increased the number of women in their R&D um, department or in management positions. Few ideas to help if uh, the issues in this thematic area. Well, one uh, which is to promote further legislation policies and initiatives that stimulate gender inclusiveness and do this both at, at external and internal levels. I mean, at the end of the day, there should be um, enough policies and legislation that help mitigate and reduce any existing gender gaps. Um, and of course, also creating internal policies to be a powerful means to promote gender within institutions and organizations. Another one here would be uh, to expand the acceptance of alternative collateral, so to be more open to explore uh, different possibilities and make it the general rule. Let's say, for example, when it comes to collaterals required um, to ask for a loan, um, well, the banking sector could look for alternatives to ensure that women have access to financial services, maybe, I don't know, accepting jewels or other form um, or of, of collateral. And now, about to finish, let's move to the final thematic area, which is uh, funding and resources. And this, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, refers to hurdles at the institutional and corporate levels regarding the limited availability of resources, both funding and uh, human capital, to implement planned actions, uh, make new investments in women's financial inclusion, and to create more affordable DFS solutions for women. Um, of course, of um, course, there is always more that can be done. I mean, um, there's a couple of recommendations um, here that we are proposing to bridge the gap. And uh, we have to say that there's great work ongoing on this front, uh, and such is the case of CIGAP and other development institutions and agencies, which are providing their support in terms both of funds and human capital to allow uh, for making progress on the implementation of interventions uh, to foster financial inclusion of women Ghana. So a couple uh, recommendations here, very brief. One would be to boost advocacy and consultations for impact funding um, and technical support to implement these strategies. I mean, uh, bigger changes can happen if some more impact funding becomes available. And uh, finally, also to explore additional measures to rate access and affordability of DFS products and services. And this can include um, upgrading infrastructure, uh, expanding access of um, well, access and agency banking coverage, for example, or using other bold approaches and seamless, seamless models uh, to reach women in particular. Now, to summarize a bit what we have been saying, um, as we have seen throughout the presentation, um, DFS has contributed a lot to advance women's financial inclusion in Ghana. And it has a huge potential to create way more value and impact for women in the years to come. However, uh, to make this happen and turn it into reality through specific activities, there needs um, to be more focused efforts from all key stakeholders and decision makers involved. Um, as you can see here in, in, in the slide, we have noted uh, some of the key drivers and activities that can contribute to reducing the gender gap and enhancing financial inclusion for women. Uh, these are the boxes that we have put here in, in, in blue. Now, of course, um, we are well aware that we have covered and touched upon quite a few different types of challenges and recommendations um, that speak to various stakeholders in our audience, uh, some more than others. But uh, please remember that the key objective here is uh, to take away what speaks to you within your role and contribution in this area to women's financial inclusion. So uh, let's take a personal and, and close view to this, right? And of course, uh, feel free to get in touch with the CICAP team and or ourselves at the Insights if you would like to discuss um, anything further on this. Now that we're clear on what we want and, and have some appropriate paths to get there, uh, let's leverage this, uh, take one day at a time, and let's really make financial inclusion, gender parity become the new normal. 
Um, thank you so much. And yeah, buddy, the mic is all yours um, to start the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Hope this is useful. Uh, thank you very much, Alicia and uh, the African Sites team. I hope uh, everyone has found this information um, useful, insightful. It's, it's quite dense. Um, so uh, we're hoping during the next session where we invite our panelists to interrogate some of this content and, and also get their personal experience, given that they're really at the center um, of working on financial inclusion broadly and also women's financial inclusion um, more specifically. So without further ado, um, uh, I want to introduce uh, our, our esteemed panel. Uh, I'm not going to include myself in the estimation of that. The esteemedness re refers to um, Esther Dasanu, who is the Manager at Affirmative Action for Women in Africa at the African Development Bank, AFDB. Um, Ms. Clarissa Kudowo, who is Assistant Director at the Bank of Ghana. Ms. Mercy Munoni, who is Assistant Director at the Ministry of Finance in Zambia. So, um, without further ado, I wanted to ask, um, perhaps uh, Esther, since I can already see your video, um, if you can tell us a little bit about your role, the, the, what AFRIWA does, and, and what, if anything, from what you've seen today resonates with yourself and the objective of your organization in, in helping to push the financial access, um, reduce the financial access gap for women. Um, thank you so much, Buddy, and also to Alicia for uh, the African site research. I mean, um, it's actually, uh, it hits directly into what the affirmative finance action for women in Africa is really all about. So, um, uh, basically, a power is an initiative of uh, the African Development Bank which uh, aims to reduce the financial access gap for women entrepreneurs on the continent. So as we know, that gap today is estimated to be around $42 uh, billion, of which a huge component uh, hits uh, SMEs or women-owned SMEs um, in, in our region, basically. And so for us, the goal is to, one, be able to showcase that women are a strong business case, right, and a safe risk to take by financial institutions, to enhance financial institutions' ability to understand the market, and in that process, come up with different uh, financial mechanisms to de-risk the, uh, the women's portfolio. And I can go into that a little bit more. Um, and then, of course, enhance women's ability to understand, as well, the financial sector, understand where they fit within that, that the, 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 the financial sector. So uh, there are different types of institutions. There are different types of mechanisms. Um, there is also a time that is more appropriate than another for a business overall to, to, to request for financing. And so all these things are important knowledge pieces for women entrepreneurs to have as they decide on their strategies to, um, to grow their businesses. And then, of course, um, it is critical for us to ensure that the enabling environment is conducive to increasing financial access. Um, or access to finance, depending on which way you see it, um, uh, for for women entrepreneurs. And so, uh, as Alicia was saying earlier, she talked about you know collateral flexibility. Indeed, because if at the regulatory level, the only type of collateral that is acceptable is land or property, then no matter the amount of activities and, uh, you know, efforts made by financial institutions or by DFI, at this point, that's all they can accept, right? And so that, unfortunately, will keep um, leaving women out. So for a FAWA, basically, we want to ensure, and this is really our theory of change, to hit on all these three aspects. So one is the financial access, meaning the money being here and available for the women to be able to tap into. 
The second is ensuring that both at the supply and demand side, there is a common understanding. And uh, Alicia pointed to, you know, the gap in understanding, which unfortunately makes it that women don't access. And then the third is ensuring that the enabling environment that uh, we are operating into is conducive to to increasing women's um, access to to finance. Great, thank you. Uh, Clarissa, anything to add? Uh, introduce yourself and then also your role in the Bank of Ghana. This this research is, is, is specifically on Ghana, so we, of course, are interested to hear, of course, in a personal capacity. I know we cannot claim that you're speaking for the Bank of Ghana, but uh, in a personal capacity, what you took away from this, uh, from this research. Thank you, Buddy, and thank you, Afri Insight, um, for the invite to be part of this, this webinar. And so July 2020, I was heading the Financial Inclusion Desk in the Payment Systems Department of Bank of Ghana. I now head the Authorization and Innovations Office, which is responsible for appraising bank products and uh, services under Section 10 of the Payment Systems and Services Act. I was also part of the team that drafted the National Financial Inclusion Development Strategy. I'm a member of the AFI DFS Working Group, the Gender Focal Point, as well as the lead for the DFS and Gender Subgroup. Um, I had led in the publication of two knowledge products on women's financial inclusion. And one of that products led me to get an understanding of the several government initiatives that um, had been in place since 2004, which previously I didn't know about. And uh, on hindsight, I wish I had had that information when we were drafting the strategy, because government already had several initiatives in driving the gender gap generally, not so much in financial services, but generally in terms of empowering women and women equality. And so, um, and apart from reading the policy initiatives, we also had the machinery to make sure that it was successfully implemented. For instance, all the MBAs were supposed to have gender desk in the department, but um, I didn't know. And um, we didn't have, but for the tax force, I don't remember there was somebody in the Ministry of Finance who was representing that gender tax force. If we knew, we would have brought somebody like that on board. Then again, when I tried to uh, try to introduce the gender perspective, it was so much late in the day, and so I was told that well, after the implementation, after the launch, the subsequent meetings will try and engage the sector ministry to be part, very much part of the thing. And so, like um, Alicia said earlier on, I think the the need for focused engagement with all stakeholders matter really because you can't have done a thing, we couldn't have done a thing like that without the gender ministry, which is mandated to look at issues that deal with gender, children, and social protection. And with what was, has been just shared with us, um, for me, what resonates more loudly with me is the fact that the second bullet, who talks about gender is not a widespread priority. Having read the death of um, information that the government has since 2004 to date. In 2004, we had the National Gender and Children's Policy. In 2015, we have the National Gender Policy. And that there's so much in there. And you're wondering, so what is missing? For instance, um, in 2004, government set up the national ma machinery to see gender equality and women empowerment. And then in 2015, we have um, we had uh, the, the the various uh, ministries being given specific roles. And for instance, Ministry of Finance, under which we fall, they were tasked to safeguard the operationalization of a poli of a gender policy by ensuring that gender issues were mainstreamed throughout all aspects of the national development financing and related processes, enforce compliance with the national gender budgeting guidelines, 
and then also ensure that budgetary resources are made available to Ministry of to the Sector Ministry. One thing I found very interesting was the fact that in in the policy, as far back as 2015, the um, Ghana Statistical Survey was to initiate the collection and documentation of gender specific data and promote the production of sex disaggregated information about sexual matters in all sectors regarding issues of women, men, girls, boys, including persons with disabilities. And these are things that is now coming to the fore for us in the regulatory space. So um, I wish if we had had these dialogues much earlier, I think we'd have had a lot more gains than we have now. Uh, pause here Thank for now. Thank you very much, Clarissa. I, I mean, so what I'm hearing from you is that um, whereas, whereas it may not always be specifically as it relates to financial services, there is some lip service or some consideration for gender gaps within government, but um, that may just be to tick the box and there's a need for more concerted, um, deliberate and aggressive effort to translate those policies and strategy documents into actual um, actions and perhaps even um, hold particular institutions and ministries and agencies to the delivery of those targets. I'd like to um, in, invite Mercy, Ms. Mercy Munoni, to please come in and, and give us um, some idea from your perspective as, um, you know, coming from the Ministry of Finance, which, uh, which as in, perhaps in, in Zambia is different, but, you know, it would have the central bank falling underneath it here and would be, uh, you know, would take particular interest in, in issues of, of the gap in, in financial access between males and females. Uh, do you feel that um, enough attention is being paid, that the gender lens is being, uh, is being placed on just generally regulation and, and policy overall or, or specifically around policies uh, for financial inclusion? And, and, if, and if there have been some specific initiatives in Zambia that have been introduced to improve that, um, what, might, what, what those have been and what, what has the outcome been? And Mercy, are you on mute or? Uh... I'm on now. All right. Good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Um, as introduced, and thank you so much to the facilitators uh, for this important uh, topic, which uh, personally I hope to learn so much, and I have learned through the presentation uh, what is happening in Ghana, and I would like to learn more. Um, I basically, in terms of introducing myself, um, I work in the Ministry of Finance under the Economic Management Department, and I head a unit that looks at financial um, sector policies uh, as well as regulations. So in the Ministry of Finance, we work very closely with the regulators. On the main regulators that we work with, uh, it's the Central Bank, which is our Bank of Zambia, then we also work closely with uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission. We work closely with the Pensions and Insurance Authority uh, regulator. And uh, we also work with other uh, regulators uh, in the financial sector, such as the, 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 the regulator that is handling the consumer, the con consumer, and com consumer protection, uh, as well as we are also working closely with the regulator that works on um, Information and Technology Authority. So we, 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 we have some kind of collaboration. So maybe just to give a little bit of what we are doing as Ministry of Finance, because we are at police level. So what I'm just from presenting is basically how we are coordinating at policy level as well as the regulators. So we do have a policy that we've uh, developed uh, which is uh, it's running for about 10 years from 2017 to 2027, and that is handling, it's, we, it's a financial sector policy. And under that, we have developed a number of strategies at policy level. So we do have the National Financial Inclusion Strategy, and basically our baseline there is our FinSCO 2015 uh, survey that was undertaken. And then we also have the Rural Finance uh, Policy, 
uh, more or less driven from the financial sector policy. And uh, we, under the same national financial inclusion strategy, we have also developed our national financial education strategy. So these are some of the at policy level that we are using to implement financial inclusion. And in there, we do have specific targets for women. Uh, I think what I've observed is in Zambia, we don't have a lot of it between male and female. So, um, to, um, male, um, for example, for 2015, we have a male financially included. And uh, for women, so you see the disparity. Not so much. Uh, disparity between the rural and the, the rural female and the urban people. Uh, when it comes to to the women, uh, in the Cisco. And maybe that's also the one that we are using. So right now we're trying to. Work to see how we could incorporate some of the But not to say there isn't much that we're doing out there. We are working very closely also, also with our some operating partners. I can give an example of very closely that in Zambia. They also are studies regarding their target groups and their target different kind of disagreement. If the data for that to come to what you ask, uh, we are giving giving enough attention to uh, just like I have I, I, I think I think I'd like to explain uh, probably what I would say, just as it has been um, regards to maybe police makers, police makers at level, in high level decision making, how it could help with the drive um, in terms of like you have a woman there driving. I think they oh, the um uh uh in fact and then uh, and uh, and then, uh, I think the other issue is so interrupt. I think because of the uh, your line is breaking up, perhaps you should turn off your video. Hello? Yes, we're having a, a bit of a, a, your line is breaking up a bit, so perhaps if you turn off your video, that might help with the bandwidth. Oh. Yes, if you can just, yes. You can try now. If you can just finish your thought. Oh, um, am I? Yeah, yeah, and audio is perfect. If we can just stay with the audio. Thank you. Okay, so with regards to, yes, in terms of the policies that we have, what the issues are the interaction and implementing that we have is with regards to enforcement, population and Presenter, what they presented, kind of compliance with some of those policies. For us, it's more of we come up with and we try to encourage the institution to undertake um, activities or develop together. It isn't really that mandatory, which may be required from Ghana. They do have, uh, 
transparency on some of these in the uh, in terms of objectives that we are doing with regards to promoting financial inclusion, um, I'm thinking this, this has become a business where in these uh, village projects, we call them village banks, and uh, most of the people have the central bank as well as the But you know we are encouraging it, and we have the sector dependent who are really running with it. We over, um, over, over, over women uh, or groups. These are groups of, of women. I'm or having, women. having trouble, trouble hearing you. So perhaps the percent of the composition banking. Sorry? Yeah, we're having trouble hearing you. Perhaps if you can reconnect and we can try again. Are you getting me now? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we, it, it's intermittent. So my suggestion is that we reconnect. If try to reconnect. Sorry, I muted myself by accident. Hello? Um, Okay, so I, I, one thing I did pick up from, from Mercy's intervention was about um, the need and the processes that are being undertaken to actually collect data in a, in a disaggregated uh, fashion. Um, and, and I know specifically in, in Ghana, providers now are being asked to collect that data um, in a dis disaggregated manner. And of course, some of the larger studies that we're seeing, the FinScope, FII, are, are, are collecting data on you know, a nationally representative uh, scale. The, the challenge, though, is that those large nationally representative studies only happen you know, periodically. They're very expensive. They're usually a development partner uh, funded. Uh, what mechanisms can there be, really, uh, to to sort of localize this, bring it down so that there can be perhaps not as comprehensive, but certainly some measure of collection of data on financial services um, that allows for a country uh, to be able to create its own system for, for collecting that data. Um, I want to throw this both uh, to, to you, Clarissa, as the central bank, because the central bank is collecting a lot of data directly from uh, from providers and is also giving um, instructions to providers on, you know, what format that data should take. But I also want to get your views, Esther, on, on uh, you know, on how we can move away from this external partner focused approach of creating data, right? Basically, how can we localize that data collection? Uh, Esther, would you like to start? I see you smiling, so. I, I'm at a disadvantage because you see me. Um, so, <laughs> so I mean, I, I, I think there are two things. I think there is there, there are the requests, if you will, from central banks to require for that data to be collected, right, and to, in a very systematic manner analyze the data that is being collected at national level and ideally on a yearly basis, right? If it's done in a consistent manner, then um, there is no reason to a certain degree why that, that wouldn't be the case. I think the issue here, though, is that the incentives for uh, the financial institutions to do so is not there, right? Um, and so for us, as 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 development, uh, if you will, institutions, we are now requiring this of every single project that we implement. Uh, the data has to be gender disaggregated. Uh, we go as far as from our diagnostic all the way to uh, the products and services that we, uh, together with the financial institutions that we work with, put on the market. Uh, require to understand what is the uptake from the women entrepreneurs that we're trying to serve. Um, 
because it's based on that that we're able to show the financial institutions, as I said earlier, that the women the women's market is a viable market and a risk worthy market. So this is being done, if you will, systematically at at our level, but it also needs to be done systematically, I think, at uh, the level of, of the central banks. And it's not just about collecting the data. It's about telling the story of the data. Basically, what is it exactly telling us? And being more bold, I think, in, in, in you know, saying it. If, if women are not repaying, then we need to say, well, we thought they were repaying, but they're not repaying, so now we need to do this. Uh, or we need to approach it in a certain way. If women are repaying, though, we need to be able to say uh, that they are. And I think that financial institutions should be encouraged and incentivized also to, to do it. It's funny because as uh, uh, Alicia was um, was presenting earlier, there are financial institutions on the uh, on the continent, commercial banks, who have very strong programs for women entrepreneurs. They've been rolling it out for a number of years, and obviously, it must be profitable, right? It must be yielding some form of result because if it wasn't, they wouldn't be doing it anymore. So, why can't we not, if you will, put those cases with the data that they have collected over the years, right, more prominently out so that the rest of the financial sector and the rest of the countries uh, on the continent can also see, right, that there is, that one, it's possible to collect the data because all financial institutions will tell you it's too complicated, but actually it's not that difficult. Um, that too, the data does in, well, in the instances where the financial institutions have a targeted approach, uh, does, uh, you know, corroborate the fact that women are actually a safe risk. Um, yeah, I think there is a need for that exercise also to, to be undertaken. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you. I think um, I had Messi mention earlier on about the fact that uh, if we had women heading, uh, I don't know whether she meant the ministry or some organization, there would be better place to push the financial inclusion agenda, women's financial inclusion agenda. But I want to say that that woman needs to be aware that there's a gap. Because for me, until I started getting involved in that space, I wasn't aware. And more so, I became even a victim. Then the thing, because otherwise, what's the need? Why all that noise? But when I became a victim, it became more pronounced. And so, just having a woman head in it doesn't solve the problem. There's a need to be aware. And then data, that data that you need, the institutions need to understand why. Why you want the granular data. Because at the end of the day, they benefit because they have the data to mine to better design their products. For instance, I remember when we, do the, we were doing our um, agent registry for mobile money agents, and we told them we we're going to have it on gender basis. And within the gender, we'd like to have um, um, whether the owner was a male or a female. And then when you came to the manager, because sometimes you find these are just sales girls. They don't own it. That's granular data. And they're like, do you also need that? Said, yes, you're talking about women empowerment. Well, you know, she's just a sales girl. She doesn't own it. And so... When, when one of the providers got it, I saw a smile, and it was so fulfilling. Smile that had gotten through to him, and he appreciated it. So he was very much, see, we need to create that awareness for people to then seamlessly would want to provide the data. Already they are, they complain the, of the burden of giving so much data. But if you don't create that necessary awareness, they'll just throw anything at us. And because they are not using it, they're not mining, just sending it to us, they're not doing seeing the economic value of that data they have. They are churning up products and services for women, which women are not using because they understand the data they have. So I think and before we even say we are collecting, we should engage them and have that dialogue for them to understand why we need. Not so much because the regulator needs, but you, the pro pro provider, needs more than anything else. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Somebody actually is asking, you know, 
and, and we're getting questions from the chat, so please do feel free to continue to provide your, your questions. Someone is asking of regulators, well, when you collect that data, when you get it, I mean, assuming that providers have now understood that they, are, they either are bound to or they even want to collect it and send it to the regulator, you know, how is that being translated into actual actions or, or policies that are going to be, you know, really moving the needle? And I don't know if there are any examples that you've seen, either, either um, Clarissa or Esther or, or Mercy, if you're back with us. Um, you know, when we have gotten over the hurdle of collecting data, what good examples are there of using that data to really move the needle? So, yes, on my end, uh, the one example that I can think of is uh, Nigeria, uh, where it was because of the data collected that at some point in time, the central bank governor required that uh, you know, a certain percentage, a minimum of a certain of a percentage of a portfolio be earmarked to women, right? Uh, it was because of the data collected that it required that at the boards and senior management of financial institutions that there be a more inclusive process, right? So ensuring that women would be. Um, uh, either in on the board or in the senior management of these financial institutions. And it, it, it just so happened that Nigeria is one of the countries that is performing slightly better when it comes to that. Um, so it does, again, right, yield um, some results when the, the data is properly analyzed. Now, it could be taken a lot further, and I, I completely agree with, with Carissa in the sense that um, making sure that those who are uh, being asked to collect the data understand first and foremost that it's not, it has a positive impact on them at the end of the day, right? It helps in further understanding the clients that they're serving. It helps in creating uh, better suited or better suitable services or more suitable services for, for, for their, their clientele. But at the end of the day, on a, on a grander scheme of things, it also enables us to achieve the national targets that we're setting for ourselves. Those national targets have a tendency to, they have a ripple effect basically on other things. They have a ripple effect on the amount of financing that a country gets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think it is really important to, to, to definitely table that. I also agree to the fact that uh, having women involved is important, but it's even more important to have educated women who understand the gap, who understand uh, the importance basically of pushing the agenda forward, um, uh, involved in the process. It's not just about, you know, having a women or having women, sorry, um, there because in some instances we've seen financial institutions that have women at their, at their head and it's the opposite that you get. It's almost like, well, why should we zero in on women? The problem is there for everyone. So I think you have to be also very careful about that. Yeah. We, we have been complaining about the patriarchy for a long time, so there's no reason to believe we would, wouldn't have those instances. Mercy, are you back? Maybe you have anything to add? Yes, I'm back. Thank you. Am I, can I be heard? Please go ahead. Yes, uh, so I just wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about um, in terms of the data that is collected. Uh, maybe I'll just give an, uh, an example of how we actually try to make sure that we, we try to incorporate everybody from the demand side as well as the supply side, and more so on the supply side, the financial institutions. So, uh, like I indicated, we are implementing the National Financial Inclusion Strategy, and in there, we have come up with different uh, subsectors of the financial sector where we have working groups. And in those working groups, we do have representatives on the supply side as well as on the demand side. 
So depending on the different outcome of those working groups, so maybe I can give an example of one um, target that we have where we want to increase the access points for um, the access points for which, like in, in, in an area. Uh, so we do have even institutions, like I mentioned, the financial sector deep in Zambia, that go out there and we do have a number of surveys that take place and they're able to assess with regards to the access points and based on that information that is gathered, we are able to now see how do we best involve the service providers or at police level, how do we provide a conducive environment to ensure that these uh, financial institutions can actually set up their businesses in the areas where access points are limited. So, um, in, in terms of, uh, so I, I can also give an example. It's because of the um, engagement or the data that is collected or the consultations that we undertake, that we are able to actually, um, we are able to, 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 we were also able to get information with regards to the challenges that especially women face when it comes to providing collateral. And it is as a result of that that we came up with the movable collateral register. So it has been, it has, it has been now, it, it, it's a law that actually movable um, collateral could actually be considered by the uh, financial institution. So this is just to echo that the data that is collected, of course we cannot take up everything, but in consultations and within the limited uh, resources uh, of uh, the policy makers as well as the regulators, we do listen and we do uh, make a certain policies around the data that is collected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Percy. Actually, you, you, bringing up the, fine, um, the collateral registries and movable collateral is perfect because one of the questions we received in the chat was about the trade-off between financial stability and these types of, you know, the flexibility of introducing a collateral registry or a movable uh, collateral so that you can include more people in the financial process. Does that not actually introduce additional risk into the financial system? The assumption there being that women um, seeking to get credit would be more likely to, to, um, to only have um, a movable, movable, immovable, you know, movable collateral, and therefore that would then, if you give them more loans, then there's a greater portion of loans that are riskier because it's not um, movable, immovable collateral. Um, I want to get your thoughts on that and also Clarissa or, or Esther, anyone who can speak to this question of the, the trade-off, if there is any, between financial inclusion and financial stability. Thank you. There always has to be a balance because if you look in the traditional system where we had women um, seeking to better their lot, sometimes selling their crops to give their children to food, even get consumption or educate their kids, or sometimes they even place their prized property so that they could pay for something. The collateral registry, in terms of the movable one, has kind of formalized because now we have women-owned businesses with registering their uh, movable properties there. And if you're uh, an entrepreneur and you had access to that information, even if your bank didn't provide, you get to, when you get in there, you realize that, oh, so this, this is my stock. I could also provide it as collateral. Because let me tell you, some, some of them don't even know what a collateral is. I had the um, privilege to sit in a, a panel. No, I wasn't part of the panel discussion conference where an entrepreneur, small scale, medium uh, entrepreneur, a woman owned by a woman was asked to share her experience. And she said she went to a, a bank to ask for a loan. And when she was asked if she had a collateral. She asked them what was a collateral. So they had to educate her on what a collateral was. And so for some of these things, um, if they know or they are aware, it, it makes life easier for everyone. And I think that they already, it's up, they already operate in the informal sector. And so the collateral registry has just kind of formalized it. And once it's that visible, I think we can put in a lot more women if they are aware that I can assess a facility and, and, and that this is what it entails. And um, there's also data that says women pay better. But then again, the data would enable that we would confirm whether it is true. And if it's true, what are the other incentives that could be given to women without necessarily overburdening them with debt? Because at the end of the day, 
We want a resilient financial system. We don't want women to be overburdened with debt, and then they can't pay with financial institutions. You know, we need to have that balance. We really need to have that balance. And as much as we want to empower them and um, give, make them economically independent, I don't think we want to burden them. As, because we don't just burden the, the financial institution. We also burden the uh, indebted customer. Because at the end of the day, she's back to zero. She's in debt. She can't move on. You haven't helped her. You only made her worse off by throwing uh, credit facilities at her because you thought she was paying. But she had that responsibility and it wasn't everything she was throwing at you. So, I mean, we need to have a balance. These are the people who can weaken the institutions when we don't manage it well. Thank you. So, yeah, and to add to that, I think it's not, the question is not to not go with collateral at all. Right? The question is to ensure that one way or another, the risk that this given SME is presenting is covered. Is it, does that mean that the, the only kind of collateral that can be taken is, you know, a title or a, or a property, uh, or land or a property title? I don't think so, right? Um, uh, movable collateral are also things that have value to these women entrepreneurs that would cause them to want to repay. I think the other bit also is to ensure that we are a bit more open. So, for example, one of the things that Abawa is about to come out with is a guarantee mechanism that de-risks the women portfolio. So when she comes, she has, you know, the, the level of collateral that she would be required to provide is lessened because she's covered at the end of the day by a backup entity, right? And so that makes you think of, okay, what are the other things that are out there, i.e. insurance, for example, that could be used more often if it was structured in a way that would enable financial institutions to leverage that as collateral because at the end of the day, they're also paying for, for these types of things. I think in addition to that, it's really important that uh, we are following these SMEs very closely. Because the truth of the matter is, it's not because you have the collateral in place that she will repay or not repay the loan. You see what I mean? How many times was the collateral there and the loan wasn't particularly repaid? Not only was the loan repaid, but the amount that you expected to get back from it, you didn't get back because it takes so much longer to be able to pull right, and get the financing from the property and so on and so forth. So that leads to the need to really build the relationship between the financier and the person being financed, right? Because as you're following, you can preempt a lot faster, a lot sooner, and come up with mitigation uh, points or mitigation mechanisms in order to enhance the ability for that person to pay. And this is where it's interesting when you work with women because their uh, risk awareness or risk averseness, whichever way we want to see it, causes them to tell you even before, you know, the, <laughs> even before the problem had happened, that a problem is about to happen. So this is, you know what I mean, I, I, I might need some help or I might need a bit more time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, the technical assistance that we're providing to these women entrepreneurs needs to be done hand in hand with the financial institutions that are providing the loan. You see what I mean? Because it enables us very early on to one, create the trust, and Alicia referred to that, so to create the trust that needs to be there so that she's giving you that information early enough and that as the financier, you're taking that and making sure that you're conducting your analysis properly in order to start coming up with mitigation or mitigative risk, if that's the word. Um, yeah, so I think it's just, it's just really critical that we're not going also based on the fact that she's coming to get the loan and she's not going to repay it. Nobody, I hope nobody thinks that way. Women definitely don't think that way. When they come to get the loan, technically they have already thought about what they need to have in place in order to repay it, right? But we need to harness that, and that is only harnessed by the, the trust relationship that is created between the financee and the financier. Okay, great. Right. So, so, so I have to start there. 
uh, very much so you need to build a relationship to handle the, the process. But sometimes they get lost in the middle and they, there's no way to fall back on. And um, especially when they get stuck in the middle and they don't know how to grow their businesses. They really don't know what to do. Like to have a relationship. They can easily fall back and you can also visit them to find out how they are doing. Because at the end of the day, it's the first best friend you have given to her. Mm -hmm. to turn around her to become better off. And so usually when they get stuck, it's really difficult to rise up again if you don't get that hand with them up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we, we don't have any providers here in the panel, but I, I think they, they do play a really, you know, a significant role. And, and our second um, webinar is, is, um, is happening a week from now, um, which is actually going to be focused more on developing um, why and how you can develop projects that are more tailored towards women. I mean, I have heard you know, anecdotal information that women are better payers. We've even heard it in this discussion today. So it's rather curious to me that women struggle still to have, you know, financial products designed for them if indeed they are a, a less risky proposition. I mean, one of the questions I just mentioned to you from one of our, uh, our participants would imply that women are actually a riskier proposition, right? So how do we how do we break that down? How, what, and, and what is the role of, of development partners and and central banks and ministries of finance to I mean apart from getting the data, which I think is really critical, but is this something that we should leave up to providers who are profit seeking and say, listen, it's, it's women are a profitable segment. If you haven't figured that out, then that's up to you. Or should there be a more aggressive uh, you know uh, activist approach to, you know, molding the supply side so that it addresses this gap. Nope. Um, I think the regulators can support by building hubs that are gender sensitive to suit the needs of these and, and in collaboration with the Providers, because at the end of the day, they will turn these consumers around. The 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 hubs will kind of um, kind of provide financial um, skills, um, create awareness, especially if she, she's moved, she's now starting from a tabletop, and you think there's potential she can move. And so, uh, I don't see the commercial banks investing in those areas. They want ready-made customers, but somebody has to provide the service. I know with the NatWest, they had, um, I participated in a webinar about last year where they had developed this concept of a hub where she starts, but they start from within their own institution as well as they have this hub where every woman, is, they create their awareness and they train you to be able to manage a female client when she walks in from scratch to when you think that she has arrived. and. Um, that was a, a private sector initiative, but looking at a terrain, I think if we had, if the regulator could support a thing like that with, with um, industry association, bring it some support because at the end of the day, they can come in and provide the technical support to the, um, what do you call it, the consumers of the facilities. And um, also with the um, literacy, I think, most, most, most countries is usually done by the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank. I don't know about the other countries because um, in as much as the uh, commercial banks want to do, they rather would like to focus on their products and services. But we're looking at a generic thing where the female consumer would understand what it is across whichever bank he or she approaches. So at the time she's approaching the financial service provider, she understands what is in there. She, she understands that when a, a bank sends you a text that you qualify for, let's say, $100,000, you don't take it, you, you, you don't need it. It's a straight case of being overburdened, and then it's a straight case of a bad debt in the bank's books. And so some, these are some of the things that um, I think that if we had um, collaboration from industry as well as the regulator, maybe even government, to have a, a machinery like that in place, it, it would help greatly for for all stakeholders to understand that everybody matters in that space to, to empower the woman and uh, move her out of poverty and make life better for her. 
Um, can I say something as well? Please go ahead, Mercy. Yes. Um, so I would. Uh, uh, you you posed the question to say, do we need to leave it to the financial institutions, or can we be a bit more aggressive at uh, policy making? Um, I think I would go with both. Uh, maybe I would start with what is working for Zambia. In Zambia, I think among the partner, uh, the, the financial institutions, there's a realization that actually women, um, like it has already been discussed, that they're actually good at paying their debt uh, in comparison to our male folks. And then uh, generally there's been this culture of uh, our bank, our, uh, our banking uh, institutions on just considering the, 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 the immovable collaterals. You know, looking at maybe land or property in terms of houses or, you know, things like that. But then you find in our culture, women generally don't tend to have such. It is now that now women are coming up, but it's still at a very slow pace. But uh, in Zambia, generally, there is this appreciation that actually women could offer as much business as the men do. So we are having, I can give an example, we do have some com uh, a commercial bank. Uh, which is uh, the standard among the standard banks of uh, the standard bank groups, where they are actually uh, offering a, a, they are calling it in our language, but it's a women's uh, account. Uh, Anakas, it's a, it's, it's a women in our, in our language here. So they they have that like a women's account, an account that is specifically for women. They are also offering insurance products specifically for women. So we are hoping this is going to encourage a lot of other financial institutions because these are more or less new ground. And like other speakers have mentioned, that um, banks also they want to 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 to, to, be, to do business where it's less risky. So uh, I think as they also as we also do more promotions on that. But then on the aggressive part, I'm thinking on our policy 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 level. The way that we could be a little bit more aggressive and encouraging is to try and see how best we could uh, promote or in, uh, provide some incentives. So let's say maybe we could give you a bit of some some tax incentives if you provide certain uh, um, products to women. So just to to to, to motivate uh, more financial institutions to get into that space. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can say on that. That's great. Uh, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, I think uh, as, as DFI, for us, it is uh, the best way to influence financial institutions is to show them where the business case is. We're not in the business of distorting the market, right, because we want the financial sector to be strong. And so by, by basically showing them where the business opportunity is, the impact that it has on their bottom line, the impact that it, ha that it has on their ability to diversify their portfolio. We're talking about risk, so you don't want to take all your risk and put it in one uh, basket at the end of the day. Um, and also ensuring that we're basically accompanying them to the process. So that today, the number of DFIs that have very specific, uh, if you will, uh, financial programs for, for the women's market are, I think, all across the board, right? There are investments specifically that goes towards a uh, portfolio that focuses only on women. I talked about the de-risking mechanism earlier, which again is a way to encourage to say, look, because we have confidence in this market, we're actually willing to cover the risk. So that should that should go uh, uh, far. But it's to say, not only are we going to cover the risk with you, we're even going to capacitate you and your staff in order to deliver the right types of financial services to, to, to women entrepreneurs. I think that's the role that, that we can play. Um, while we're playing that role also is to keep them to, start, to task by saying we're putting in, but we want you to still provide your results, good, bad, or ugly. And if they're bad, then at that moment, let's 
keep working together until such time where where it becomes, uh, if you will, positive. So that's definitely the role that that we can play, while at the same time work with the regulators right across the board to ensure that we're also enabling them to come up with the right regulations, with, with the right data, and so on and so forth. Mr. Mercy, Clarissa, Alicia, for this fantastic session. Unfortunately, we've come to time and we may not have been able to answer all the questions. Uh, one uh, individual complained that there were no males on this panel. I don't know if he's ever gone to a, a session where there were all males and complained that there were no women, but we have a long way to go. Uh, and, and indeed, the next step, at least for us, is uh, to, to reconvene next week with a different set of speakers um, and different content to look at practical ways to better serve female customers. Uh, please uh, do register for that event. Once uh, The link is here, but when we send you the presentation, we hope to see some of you there. Thank you again to our panelists. Ladies, this has been a very um, insightful discussion. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Ready? Thank you so much.